I am Neil Edwards, and this is The Leadership Range, where we elevate the voices of black and brown coaches, leaders and allies, and have soulful conversations about all things at the intersections of leadership, relationships and teams, well-being and inclusion. Here I offer deep insights and practical tips for work and life. Imagine a world where you could experience what others experience. Literally experience their experience, not your own. You would be immersed in their emotions, their inner thoughts, and their dialogue, their pain, their joy, their desires, their longings. Imagine your experience of their experience being their experience of you and the impact you are having on them. You would have clear and unequivocal knowledge of the impact you're having on those around you. The reality is we cannot know ourselves without feedback from others and their experience of our impact on them. This episode might land as provocative today, but I have come to realize that provocative is often necessary. I hope what you hear opens your mind, heart, and soul to a deeper level, perhaps of something yet unknown but revealed from the shadows. There is quite a lot I'm going to ask you to hold today, so I need your focus. I need your heart. I need your soul to be present. I need it to be present here. So if you're driving or doing something active, then consider waiting to immerse yourself in this virtual connection and experience with me today. What I share here on the leadership range are my own insights based on who I am. You've heard me say it before and I'm saying it again. I believe everyone is a leader. How we show up is a reflection of where we are on our leadership range at any given moment. Sometimes we show up metaphorically big and in our power, the creative and resonant characteristics of our leadership. Sometimes we show up metaphorically small and in our weaknesses, the reactive and dissonant characteristics of our leader selves. These characteristics are both natural and nurtured, and perhaps formally informed through learning, development, and intentional reflection. Intentional leaders reflect. Beyond me being me, this work, this experience today, is primarily founded in the disciplines of coactive leadership and relationship systems intelligence, both of which I'm formally trained and qualified to share. I'm taking these models, competencies, and skills, and so on, as ingredients blended to nourish you and nourish your leadership and your good work in the world. So I'm speaking to you first as Neil, executive leadership coach and host, then from the context of being a true authorized adjunct faculty member at CRR Global and licensed facilitator of relationship systems intelligence. I'm also speaking as a qualified facilitator of coactive leadership from the Coactive Training Institute's uh, coactive leadership programs. I'm not employed by either organization, although affiliated with them. And what I share is neither an official offering of their products nor their official points of view. I am a practitioner first. These are my views and interpretations brought to life and informed by my preparation and many thousands of hours working with leaders from entry-level emerging leaders to C-suite uh, with individuals and teams around leadership, well-being, relationships, and inclusion. I share all of this to be clear where I'm coming from, uh, what is behind me and what is with me as I invite you to, to uh, connect and and be with this experience with me here today. So a moment ago I said, we cannot know ourselves without being informed of our experiences of others. At a time when many leaders are genuinely seeking to grow by deepening their understanding of themselves so they can perform better, it is crucial to know oneself as a leader and as a human in relationship to others. At a time when leaders need to work in teams and lead organizations that are becoming increasingly diverse and complex, this work of deepening is crucial because leaders need to be inclusive to produce results and win in the marketplace. Performative-driven inclusivity does not produce results and outcomes that businesses or society needs. 
we are continuing to see harm and division from the doors to the boardrooms and from the streets to the scales of justice. Racial gaps and exclusions remain entrenched. People are biased. Systems are biased. Structures are biased. Individual, systemic, and structural racism are real. Many don't want to admit or accept it, but it is a fact, and not only in the U.S. Today, we are exploring individual racism, specifically anti-black racism, because it remains the most intractable diversity issue in corporate. Companies and people come up with other names for anti-black racism, perhaps because it is more comfortable, or the status quo is systemically entrenched and being maintained, or legal jeopardy is at play, or any combination of these come into play. Although the focus here is anti-black racism, I want to acknowledge uh, the relevance across many intersections of diversity. Uh, this, this work and what I have to say can be applied in many ways, but we do have to focus, so we're focusing today. The bottom line is... This matters because companies want to see dividends from their investments in diversity and inclusion, which has been mostly a lousy failure. It is also important because many leaders want to be more inclusive, deal with their racism and bias, be better humans, and finally break the cycle of shame and make their ancestors proud. This is only for leaders interested in challenging the status quo. At the end of this episode, you will have a next step in your anti-racism journey. And by you, I mean anyone from the living room to the boardroom, but especially corporate leaders and boards. If executives and boards don't get it or don't want to get it, their companies will continue to suffer losses. Regulated and mandated diversity might put butts in seats, but it does nothing to address racism. You will have a choice, and you will know what choice you are making. Let's begin quoting Franz Fanon, psychiatrist, humanist, revolutionary author. Quote, certain things need to be said if one is to avoid falsifying the problem. I'm going to quote Francis' work a few times today, so listen out for it. So what needs to be said is people with white skin do not understand the nature of their whiteness in racism. Now before getting up in arms because I said it categorically, know that it was intentional. I want every white person listening to sit with it for a while, if you can, before going into the default white postures, these default postures that many white people go into when confronted with racism, their own racism. Recall that we cannot really know ourselves in the absence of relationship. Very few white people have black friends, real friendships with black people. There are a lot of factual reasons for that, including the reality of ratios between white and black in the population and population distribution. You can call it segregation if you want to acknowledge that fact. What is also true is that hundreds of years of racism have created a reality that simply exists as culture. Yes, slavery was abolished a long time ago, but racism was not. For those who thought it was gone with slavery, The last years and decades should have ripped that illusion away. If not, then maybe the last few weeks and months have removed scales from eyeballs. Think Google and artificial intelligence, BlackRock, Olympic swimming caps. So what about the people who are white having conversations and doing their own work? How can people who are white and cannot see experience or understand the nature of their own racism teach other people who are white the nature of their racism? Of course, it is useful to read, listen, and learn facts and notions, but until we understand impact, our own impact on others, we have barely scratched the surface of the work. We've barely scratched learning. We've barely scratched change. Racism is probably the biggest blind spot of whiteness. The current actions and investments are not producing remarkable movement in the direction of stated outcomes. Black Americans born and raised in the U.S., are not exempt. The historical social conditioning of whiteness around race and racism impacts the conditioning of people who are black. From the time a person with black skin is born in the U.S., they are in the pool of whiteness as culture. They are taught and conditioned by whiteness how to respond to whiteness because whiteness is dominant. 
Of course, there is resistance to the oppressive nature of whiteness. That's true in the U.S. But that resistance often comes at great cost, which we have all seen examples in plain view. The nature of blackness, specifically U.S. blackness, is to give deference to whiteness, which I spoke about on a previous episode. I've learned through feedback from others that I do not give the same deference and naturally resist it. My guess is it has something to do with the fact that I was born and raised outside the U.S. with a remarkable amount of diversity and examples of black leadership all around me. I'm grateful to have a different worldview. Otherwise, I would be further buried into the wretchedness of a culture steeped in white supremacy. The slight separation and my experiences in the United States give me enough room to see closer things for what they are and name them to avoid falsifying the problem. Once again, people with white skin do not understand the nature of their whiteness in racism. Even well-intentioned, presumably good people with white skin do not understand the nature of the problem. They don't understand it because they don't understand the nature of whiteness. They don't understand themselves and their negative impacts on others who are not seen and conditioned as white. Quoting Franz Fanon again, and I am changing the word Negro to black in this quote for the sake of modernization. Quote, The black enslaved by his inferiority, the white man enslaved by his superiority alike, behave in accordance with a, with a neurotic orientation. Unquote. Obviously, the solution is for people with white skin to deepen learning about the nature of whiteness, their own whiteness, their own racism. It is not some kind of disturbance to avoid. It is a path to becoming an inclusive leader, an integrated leader, a whole leader, one who will break the cycle of shame and make their ancestors proud. For people who are black, the opportunity is to deepen learning about the nature of black responses to whiteness. I've spoken about deference here before and addressed black men navigating white spaces. There is a lot of work to do to break any patterns that might hold up white superiority and further entrench black inferiority. Both require a new kind of leadership and relationships. Otherwise, continue behaving in accordance with a neurotic orientation. Everyone is a leader, but people who are white are reactive rather than responsive when faced with their own racism. They need to learn the nature of whiteness to unlock reactivity, open creative responses, and increase capacity for self-knowledge. In the Robert Anderson and William Adams book, Mastering Leadership, they write, quote, If you are clear on your vision, and you are repeatedly failing or falling short of achieving that vision, the highest leverage place you can look is into fear, doubt, and inner conflict, that govern reactive leadership. We find unconscious beliefs. The reactive structure is designed to maintain equilibrium between current beliefs and current reality. Anderson and Adams apply this to moving from patriarchy to partnership. I am pointing at the transformation from racism to what we call allyship. 80% of adults are living and leading a reactive mind and most organizations are structured and function reactively. The authors highlight that we try to change culture as if it is separate from ourselves. We try to change it and not us. That's a mistake. The work is to discover how one personally contributes to a culture of racism. Organizations that repeatedly fail to achieve their vision for diversity and inclusion need to stop and look at their own fear, doubt, and inner conflict around racism and their own reactive tendencies to understand their own nature. Let me share a real-life example from my own experience that illustrates this. I've never shared this publicly before, and it may or may not create alarm. Nonetheless, remember, certain things need to be said if one is to avoid falsifying the problem. What I'm about to share is a fact, one fact from my experience. Not very long ago, a C-suite executive said to me directly, you cannot coach white male leaders. They will not accept inclusive leadership coaching or training from you because you are black. Maybe you could do it paired up with a white man, but the white man would need to be out front. And then went on to say, I am trying to protect you. My friends, this is someone who does not understand the nature of their own whiteness. 
who does not understand racism and how it lives in them. This is someone who should know themselves better and be a more creative leader, but based on this example has fallen short. Imagine if they understood my experience in that moment of their impact on me. In Coactive Leadership, Five Ways to Lead, author Karen Kimsey House lays out the Coactive Leadership model. It has five dimensions, which we do not have time to cover today. The dimension I would like to highlight here is called the leader within, which begins with the choice to live one's life from the inside out rather than the outside in. Karen says, quote, we tend to think of leadership as externally focused on the objective or goal rather than beginning with the truth of our own hearts. In reality, the self is the only place to begin. If we are not at home within ourselves, it is difficult to make grounded, conscious choices. When we are unfamiliar with the diverse terrain of our own inner landscape, our options will be fairly limited and one-dimensional. Unquote. What we who work in coactive leadership know is when a leader is not in a creative stance, but in the reactive pattern of leader within, they exhibit self-abandonment and self-indulgence. I assert that racism lives and emanates from self-indulgence. Racism often lives in a secret or hidden aspect of the internal landscape. These aspects need to be explored. Conscious and unconscious belief structures need to be reset. When people who are white protect, control, and hide the truth, it produces no positive results or negative results when it comes to anti-racism, inclusion, belonging, or justice. Anderson and Adams, the authors of Mastering Leadership, demonstrate in their research the powerful correlation between self-awareness and relating. They look at correlations between complying, protecting, controlling, achieving, authenticity, self-awareness, systems awareness, and relating. Across all eight of these dimensions, the most powerful contributor to self-awareness is relating. Protecting, controlling, and complying are the most negatively connected to both self-awareness and relating. Incidentally, these same three are negatively correlated to achieving. It is no wonder traditional approaches to DNI repeatedly fail to achieve their stated outcomes, the visions for inclusion and belonging. I summarized my approach to what I broadly have been calling allyship several months ago. It is inspired by Relationship Systems Intelligence, RSI for short. RSI creates doorways to explore our inner landscape, to look deeply at the secret and hidden aspects of racism within. In RSI, we don't look at conflict or disturbance as bad. We look at it as something new trying to emerge, something that wants to be part of the emerging future. We are fascinated by difference. We know that curiosity overrides fear. We know that we come to know ourselves in relationship with others. We call it right relationship. And we know it matters from the bedroom to the boardroom. It is culturally and practically easy to continue as is. But if we do, we will remain in this neurotic orientation. To quote Franz Fanon again, quote, two centuries ago, a former European colony decided to catch up with Europe. It succeeded so well that the United States of America became a monster in which the taints, the sicknesses, and the inhum inhumanity of Europe have grown to appalling dimensions. If you have ever heard the story of Daryl Davis, you know he is the black man and blues musician who befriended and ultimately led 200 or so members of the Ku Klux Klan to give up their robes. If white people, misguided with outright hate, can come to know the true nature of their whiteness and racism, and transform through deep inner work in relationship with a black man, then well-meaning white people, including business leaders, can certainly do the same, if they choose to do so. My invitation is to white people and leaders. If you are lucky enough to have black friends willing to reflect your racism for you, it is your job to open the door. If you don't have that friend, or you are a business leader at any level, the good news is there are plenty black professional advisors, trainers, and coaches who would welcome the opportunity to engage. You simply have to decide if you really want to change and be an anti-racist, inclusive leader. Free yourself from reactivity, anxiety, and fear. 
truly become an inclusive leader and achieve more at work with diverse relationships. Finally, contribute to DNI efforts in a measurable, positive way and enrich your own life. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Leadership Range. If you enjoyed the episode, I invite you to peruse the others for more great conversations. If you know someone you think ought to be on the podcast, please send me an email at neil at neiledwardscoaching.com. To connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in slash nedwards07. I look forward to you joining in for more conversations each Monday on The Leadership Range.